All right, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> Where are you going to take That's us a picture? Yeah. That's the goofy eight-year-old Josh. It's 1985, and my grandparents and all of their children are having a Cranfield family reunion at my Uncle Dave and my Aunt Martha's newly finished home. Here I am with my cousins, hamming it up for Aunt Becky. In preparing for this documentary, I've watched this video more times than I can count. It's apparent from pretty much everyone's comments that this was one of the first times anyone in the family had ever seen a VHS camcorder. It's the wonders of motion and sound all together in one device. A device that weighed close to 30 pounds and would burn your ear off if you left it up to your head too long. My dad John and I, we didn't give up the video camera in the years that followed. I remember carrying around my dad's huge JVC camcorder family gatherings up into my late teens. After a while, I think we started to wear on people's nerves. Five now, what do you think? Now. As far as you sitting down to take a crap, how, how much would that hurt coming out of it? That's nice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Remember what I was telling you, Larry? Don't, don't, what? Remember what I was telling you about video cameras? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Mom was camera shy from the start. But today she tells me how glad she is to have these memories. You see, memories are all that are left of some of the people in the family. Good and happy memories are the ones I choose to keep in my heart. Two, one, two, Well, I woke up this morning, a rainbow filled the sky. Yes, I woke up this morning, a rainbow filled the sky. But that was God telling me. Everything is going to be all right Well, so long, good friend When will we meet again? I said so long, good friend When will we meet again? Well, I don't know, I don't know But I guess I'ma see you then Oh, I'll see you, man
Growing up on the farm was um, awesome. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But when I was a kid, I used to wish I was a town kid, that I could live right up where all the action was. But looking back on it now, I wouldn't trade a thing. Um, there were so many great things about the farm itself. The traction line was fun. And I grew up with Angie and Rusty, mostly. And we would spend hours back there creating our own little worlds and, oh my gosh, fishing for leaves <laughs> and building these little huts in the trees. And it was fun every season, but winter and summer especially were so fun back the track, as we called it. But the farm was great. I loved the fields. I loved when I'd get tractor rides. When Dad was in a good mood and he'd let us ride on the trailer or on the back of the tractor and take us back to the garden. Working in the garden I didn't like, but I liked riding in the trailer. Or if he sometimes would take the truck back. Um, the house could be scary when there was rodents. <laughs> I hated the barn sometimes and the corn crib because of all the rats. But uh, it was very fun when the corn crib was full to have corn fights back and forth and throw ears of corn at each other and um, I love the gravity bed when soybeans were full and you could just get in the gravity bed and bury yourself in all those soybeans and they felt so cold and you get them in your nose and your ears and <laughs> everything else so that was fun and I liked having pet pigs until mm, you'd come home and your pig would be gone but the bacon was good <laughs> I had, I had a lot of summers. I, I, I used to, it's one of those old sayings about you, you don't realize how smart your parents are until you get old and start having kids of your own. And I think that certainly rang true with me. When I was married to Joanne, uh, we had the three children. Um, didn't realize the significance of that farm had on, on me at the time and how much of an impact it still had. They still talk about, it. they're all in their 30s now that they all still talk about when they were children, how they could remember going out to Grandma and Grandpa's farm out there, and just kind of let them get muddy and dirty and roll around and have a good time. So it's, you, you kind of lose track of the fact that things like that have a long-term effect on people. So yeah, it was, uh, for me, the memories of the farm, I think, you know, I can talk about a lot of different things. Uh, as I mentioned though, Josh, I think you know, I lose a lot of my memory of, of the things that happened when I was a kid. Uh, large chunks of time seemed to have, have evaporated on me, but uh, um, you remember things like you know, walking to Brown's grocery store over on Airport Road with Ron, and uh, sometimes Loretta, we would you know pick up pop bottles out of the ditch to take them over to Brown's store to cash them in to buy a candy bar or a pop, you know, uh, those types of things. But it was a gathering place. I remember my uncle Edward bringing his kids there to. He had the remote control airplanes. Well, where they lived, they couldn't use them. And they would all come there for things like that. It was like a big park to them, because they all lived in, more in the city, you know. And uh, Dad's sister and different ones, well, both of his sisters, and they, Dad was like their dad. And, uh, he just commanded that fatherly figure, you know. And they all came there for the family, just to be a part of it. And our New Year's Eves with Aunt Lee and Uncle Dick would come and they'd play penny and penny any poker. And the kids would all get mom would make sure we had pop and treats and, you know, stuff. But uh and they'd sit in there for hours and just play penny any poker and bullshit each other yeah. <laughs> yeah. but uh, Aunt Joanne always when she would come around we'd beg her to take us to the dairy aisle because she was an easy mark you know <laughs> <laughs> but they loved it when everybody came and mom would wrestle up a big old meal or every Sunday there was a pot of some kind of soup so it wouldn't take her a long time to do it, but she needs somebody be around. Yeah. So there was always a big pot of soup on the stove. So when you came, you could eat. <laughs> well, one of my, I was telling Martha the other day, one of my happy memories about the farm was, it just seemed like uh, 
A lot of the stuff during the winter was hard because we had the animals. But I can remember vividly, like, Grandma Cranfield helping me milk, go out and milk cows. This is my, this is my dad's mother. Yeah. And uh, I can remember just like it was yesterday, her with, and I think it was one of dad's jackets they had on like a, like a red and black plaid Mackinac jacket. And she was usually really in a good mood. She was always a positive kind of a person. But uh, she always reminded me of a little short white Aunt Jemima. And, uh, but she was out there and we were going to milk those cows and it was cool like it is now outside. And it was just, just one of those memories of me and her going in the barn and, and just together had a lot of, and she always had some cute little stories to tell you. But then one of my favorite things about growing up there, and your mom and and I think most of them can rem remember this walking, getting off a school bus in the spring of the year, and hearing the peepers, the little frogs chirping, and you think, well, oh, we made it through a another miserable winter. Mm -hmm. I can remember um, one time there was cousins there. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but we were playing um, hide and seek. It might have been Christine, my uncle Philip's daughter, but we were playing hide and seek, and we were we were all running to go hide. And when we turned to run, we got, the two of us turned at the same time and ran back the opposite at each other, and didn't realize. And I ran into her, and it, my glasses hit on top of my eyebrow, and I still have a scar there to this day. And I was so worried because I thought I broke my I messed my glasses up because you know we didn't have that much money to be buying new glasses every week, you know. <laughs> so, but, but it was always fun on the weekends because. Uh, there was always lots of cousins around, you know, growing up and everything, and that was a fun thing. Because Grandma lived right behind us in a trailer, his mother. She came to live there after my Grandpa died. I was only nine years old when we moved to Bethel, and Grandpa died right that same winter. And uh, so Grandma moved behind us, and she lived back there with her sister for a long time. And uh, and it was nice having her back there, you know. Well, yeah, because, I mean, uh, growing up, you know, um, you know, most most... I hung around with Elmer Dooley all the time, you know, Elmer and I were pretty close. And, uh, you know, we spent days and days either either digging holes back in the fields, making making forts until it rained, or making uh, tunnels until it rained, or, uh, you know, we'd just cover them up with corrugated metal and throw dirt on top of them, or uh, building cabins or tree houses and stuff like that. I mean, we spent, you know, because in the summertime, you get out of school, you know, there wasn't anything to watch on TV, there wasn't any game systems or anything else, so... Mom would just say, "Get out," you know. So you come, come back when you're hungry, you know. And that was, and that was pretty much it. So yeah. And then, you know, our place, our farm was always so friggin' wet. I mean, even, you know, it could go months without rain, but you could still find a place to stick a tractor back there. I was. He sent me back one day when he went to work. He said, uh, uh, "CG&E was clearing out the trees along the the right of way for the utility lines going through, through the place there, and they had cut up all this wood for him." and then fire length width. So he told me to take the day around the trailer back here to get that wood. So I went back here that day and I went and I I saw puddles and I knew better, even though it was dry, I knew better, but I kept going. And then it started bogging the tires down and I tried to get out, but it was too late. And when I got done, I stepped off the, uh, the, uh, the transmission case of the tractor on the level ground. I mean, I had it buried. And I know for weeks after that, I would go take a come along back here, hook it up to a tree, and pull on this David Brown. Finally, it was stuck so bad that finally Ralph Shannon had to come back here with a backhoe <laughs> and pull it out. I mean, it, this thing was, I've never, I've, I've stuck a lots of tractors and stuff now, and I just, last, last winter I stuck a pickup truck in North Carolina pretty bad, but I've never stuck anything like that tractor. But it was, <laughs> yeah, so that place was, uh, it was it was it was fun, but it was also uh, a lot of a lot of unfun memories too. But uh, yeah, but he finally gave up on me getting the tractor out. That farm was you know that was just like the best feeling in the world. Turned on that lane, you know. Sometimes I think I've grieved grieved over that farm was about as much as losing mom and dad because it was just the whole part of it, you know. Yeah. I can't believe I'm sitting there bawling over it though. Well, no, I mean, it's... You've got me here, and I cry over stuff. I, even I, happy memories make you cry. They do. They, it is happy memories, you know. It's like, I'm not... 
I'm not still grieving per se. Is that that place? It felt like the safety zone. Like you go back there and you didn't know on a Saturday who all would be around, but you always knew how everybody else was doing because everybody checked in there. That was home home base. Mm-hmm. Everybody checked in there, so it was you know. I think it was a great place to grow up, and I just I loved my life. I still do. One of the things that uh, I remember most about growing up on the farm in Bethel, Ohio is uh, it, it's probably the memory starts back uh, as far as when I was six years old, five, six years old, all the way to the time I left for the Navy. Um, the, the, the farm and living the farm and our mother and father uh, had a pretty predictive way about things. Uh, started in, uh, I'll look at it seasonally, but we'll start in the season probably of winter. Uh, in the winter time, I remember being a kid and and getting up early in the morning and having to go down the lane to go to school, um, and and things there were the same year after year after year. I think my whole childhood, I took bus number seven, and I think uh, my bus driver's name was Smitty. As a matter of fact, who later become the mayor of Bethel, Ohio. And I remember mom used to worry so much about on the really really cold days about were we warm enough and. And uh, it was always good to get on the bus and, and head out to school in the morning. I love the lane. Angie would attest to this. We could spend hours in that lane, especially after a lot of rain, when the puddles would fill up. I'm sure as an adult driving your vehicle through that, that wasn't fun. But as a child, the lane was fun. It was like playing in the mud holes. We, those were our mini swimming pools. And then Sheely's Pond that scary pond, but Angie and I would play in those trees. It was fun in the summertime, and then in the wintertime, if you had an ice storm or a snowstorm, the lane just looked like a postcard. It was so beautiful. I'll just, I'll never forget looking at it, and it just looked like diamonds everywhere. And I loved it. I loved it when the snow would pack down, and I remember um, Greg and I decided to take Chubba for a walk. Chubba was a great dog. And he, had, he was so huge, he had those big padded paws, and he loved the snow, and Greg decided to take Chubba for a walk. Well, Chubba took Greg for a walk and drug his ass all the way down the traction line. <laughs> Greg's trying to hold on, and Chubba drug him all the way down. But there was nothing prettier than the farm in the fall and in the winter. Winters could be brutal, but it was beautiful. We were always having to push cars out when people would come to visit, and... Oh gosh, great times. It was great though. But Probably got warm. my bad back from that. But you were warm. You had food. You could just stay there. Oh, it was <laughs> great. Yeah, I hated those wood stoves, and I always swore I would never get a fireplace. Ugh. But at the same time, there was no heat like that, and it was a lot. That was a lot of work. A lot of loving firewood and stuff. And, but um, again, it kept us warm. Kept us warm, and most of the time, I help keep the fire going. <laughs> most of the time. Growing up in Bethel is one of the best experiences I think anybody could have. I felt very fortunate and blessed always to be in Bethel. I was proud to be at Cranfield. It felt like I was part of a cool club that everybody wanted to be in, but they couldn't be, and I was in. So I was always proud of to my brothers and sisters before me in school because some of them was really funny and I had lots of a lot of reputation to live up to, you know. So I had great memories of my brothers and sisters and following and, you know, and being just a part of the whole Bethel scene and it was fun being, you know, what I always perceived as being one of the cool kids, you know, and working at the Dairy Isle and the, my dad let me have that 65 Chrysler to drive when I got old enough and it was the most fun car in the world, you know, so I had great memories of that and uh, growing up on the farm, I don't know, it's kind of, when you're sitting here talking about it, it's like, you can, um, you know, when you're put on the spot, you feel, feel like that maybe, but on the other hand, it, growing up on that farm, it was, a, it was such a uh, safe, even though in today's stand, standard, people would think, oh, if you threw your kids out and said, go work in your treehouse, you know, they'd be bad, bad parents. Well, there was adventures all the time. We, with me and Andy, especially, we were this, right. You know, we were so close in age, and then we had the Dooley kids, Elmer and Delvin and Curtis, and they were our age. So there was like the five of us, and we would go, you know, build stuff, or like Loretta remembers us building tunnels, and you know, we just it was adventures all the time. You didn't feel safe. You weren't scared. 
you could, you know, you could, um, you could be out of the house for 12 hours at a time, and Mom just kind of knew you were all right. We'd check back in here and there, and it was just a great experience growing up on that farm. And you know, I, I always said I was, I'm the real living Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, you know, because I had it made. I had a great, great childhood. Couldn't ask for a better one. I mean, I have a, like a vague memory of uh, like when Ron and I were in uh, high school. Um, there were a lot of times we went our separate ways during the, during the Friday nights and Saturday night uh, time frames because we, we saw different people, dated different people, but we would always wind up late in the evening. Um, we would stop at the old Green Valley store up in Bethel and uh, we'd buy a frozen ice cream pie. <laughs> it was the, the dumbest darn thing in the world. He would do the same thing. I did the same thing, too. We would go home, though, and it, I think it was midnight. It was about midnight when Bob Shreve would go on there with uh, the late-night horror shows, or he would play movies all night long. And Bob Shreve always had the sponsor of the Shaneling Little Kings. Everybody knows what they are, and they probably had more than one or two of those in their life. Um, but um, Bob Shreve, as the night would go on, he would sit there, and, and they would play a movie, they would break the commercial, come back to him, and as the night progressed, he would get more and more drunk. <laughs> and uh, Ron and I always, like I said, we would sit there on a Saturday night, late night, and eat those darn little ice cream pies and sit there and watch Bob Shreve. So we always had those great memories of that kind of stuff. Another thing that I really, and I think Linda and Sue, and I don't, I don't know how many, Ronnie didn't probably remember this. Everett and Lucille coming in and us raising such big gardens. And your grandpa made this cooker that uh, we would actually build a fire underneath this thing out in the driveway. And I think it would hold like 32 quarts of green beans or whatever, tomatoes, whatever they were canning at the time. And Everett, that's what he did on candy days. Everett came there and would keep that fire going underneath us, keep the water hot. Mm -hmm. But I remember Grandma and Aunt Bonnie and Lucille and, and your grandma, my grandmother and your grandmother, uh, your great-grandmother. But I, they would just can day after day after day. But Everett and Lucille, there was 10 or 11 kids and there were nine of us. So, you know, we, we lived off that a lot in the winter. Yeah. But I can remember them taking a pickup truck and hauling a truck load, a truck, full truck load, to Everett Lou's Hills house down on Patterson Road that they had canned there in the driveway. So I don't uh, think you can say much about our farm and living up on a farm or mom and dad without at least mentioning uh, uh, Grandma Cranfield, uh, who, who, who was one heck of a lady. Um, but she was an important part of our childhood because she spent a lot of childhood on the farm, our childhood on the farm. And, and she was a lady that was, uh, taught us skills and, and things that I think that, uh, are lost today. She used to make her own bonnets, uh, get ready for the spring and get ready for the garden. She'd make and sew her own bonnets and starch them. Um, and she would also get very excited at springtime of the year along with mom and dad, and it was a big group effort. Everyone was headed to the garden and we had to hoe and, and do those things. Uh, uh, Grandma, in, in the earlier years, uh, lived with her sister, who they were both uh, maids at the time, old maids at the time, and and uh, Aunt, Aunt Viney uh, was also a part of our um, childhood. I can remember uh, very well of going back to the little house they lived in on the farm and, and uh, watching the black and white television with them and watching gun smoke and them thinking that uh, they had to interact with the TV. Literally, they would yell, watch out behind the rocks and uh, to the cowboys and stuff. And it, it was really a hilarious uh, thing to see, to see two people that uh, got that, that much into, into that. It was a lot of fun whenever with uh, Dad's family, with our grandma lived behind us. My grandpa had died not long after we moved there. And grandma moved behind us in a little house back there. And our great aunt Viney lived with us with her, and it was nice because we would after school we'd read, run back and visit her, and and she was there and part of our life a lot too. So it was a fun time for that. I can remember her making. Um, she lived in that little house and she would make sulfured apples, and uh, that sounds disgusting, but 
they were delicious. She was somehow or another she did something in sulfur, and you couldn't stand to go into the house when she did it because it stunk so bad. But then when she dry them out and they would have them and they would she'd make little pies with them and stuff. They were so delicious whenever she would use them. But um, and then one thing she did too, she made these. Her and mom both would can these peppers with sauerkraut in the middle of them and. Oh, I love those, and I can never go on out back after school, and, and Grandma would, she'd let us do anything we wanted, and I'd go back and drag out a big one on a, on a plate and sit and eat that after school for my snack. Some of my best ones were with Grandma and Aunt Bonnie always lived in a little house there on the farm, and it was, uh, and the aunts and uncles came to visit them just about every weekend, so there were always cousins around. There was a, there was a lot going on. It was a good place, good, good childhood. We all worked hard. We all had our places. And, yeah. But it was, uh, it was a good childhood, and I think most of them would tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing in the, uh, that I wanted to talk about our grandmother about, because I, I think uh, uh, her and, and our mother were close all those years. I don't remember them having uh, any problems. But I remember Grandma helping her with a lot of different things. And as she went through the years, she had a very distinct uh, group of things that she did that were, were both funny and, and um, learning uh, opportunities for us. She made flowers for Memorial Day. Uh, I don't think any one of the children that grew up during that time frame can't remember her and Aunt Viney getting crepe paper, wire, and wax. And they would sit there and make and prepare flowers for the graves when we went to Kentucky every year, which was a big, that was the big vacation for us. And, and we'd sit in a car and fight who got the binoculars when we went all the way to Kentucky, but it was, it was a great time for us. And grandma would prepare for that for, for the longest time. And in the fall, she would get all excited. And with mom, they would can, and sometimes we had aunts and uncles there. But after that, when we got headed back for winter again, it was all about uh, getting her quilting frame up. So either me or Larry or Dave would go back and help her right in the middle of the living room. She would have that big quilting frame out and she would hand stitch quilts with Aunt Viney. And I remember sitting there with him with a TV on and just wanting to be there, just wanting to be there and talk to him and listen to him talk about d different things. I was thinking since Linda isn't able to to do an interview because um, she's left us already. I wanted to tell about her. Growing up with Linda, we were we were just a grade apart. Even though she's two and a half years older than me, we were only a grade apart because when she was little, she she fell and she hurt her leg. And I mean, she was out of school for about a year. They was even afraid at one point that they might have to amputate her leg. She had a, I think she fell from a tree or whatever. But anyway, um, when we were in school, you know, we would have fought for each other, but we used to for each other to protect each other and everybody knew I mean when I was a little girl I'd say I'm gonna tell Linda because she would have fought for me but as we got older and got to be teenagers of course we had a little bit of rivalry and we would fight and stuff but but she was always a great sister when we got in high school she was a great ahead of me and uh, she would say her friends you know they were my friends too but they would say would be going out and she'd say They'd say, can Sue go with us? Why don't she come too? And Linda said, well, if she goes, I'm not going, because she would get fed up with me being with her, because it seemed like I, I know an older sister doesn't always want their younger sister with them. But um, we would go to the ball game or whatever, and Dad had this station wagon, and she'd say, he'd say, now, where are you going to go? Because she'd want to ask to drive the car. And he'd say, oh, we're just going to go over to Bethel here and go to the ball game. Well, there were times we'd end up at New Richmond at Frisch's, because they didn't have Frisch's in Bethel, and we'd sneak off. But Dad got to where he would, he'd check the mileage on the car to make sure that it was how many miles we'd driven. And the one time in particular I remember we went to the ball game and we'd have a we'd have a bunch of people in the car, all Linda's friends and sometimes she'd put the back down in that station wagon and I can remember one time Janice and I sitting in the back seat and we had three or four other guys back there and girls and we were, they just had the whole gang there. And she was we were over by the old school which is the Evan C. Hill school and uh, she was backing up, she was parked next to the slide and uh, she went to back up and what she did she scraped the whole side of the car. Well, we was nervous wreck about that when we go home. And that night she told Dad, she said, I put a little scrape on the car tonight. So the next day he went outside and he saw the scrape. And he liked to, he liked to have a hissy fit over that because it wasn't just a little scrape. It was a pretty good sized scrape. Oh, my God, Linda. Linda was my second mom. Anywhere I went, she always read me. I always got letters from Linda. And she got me through puberty, you know. <laughs> she just was, Linda was so much to me. Um, 
I don't know what it was, but she just always took me under her wing. And uh, she was fun. God, she was fun. And she looked so forward when I moved in with her after Larry and Bart had died. She looked so forward to me being there so we could just get out and run. And then she started getting sick. But she would have me, Loretta, I want some chocolate cake. You weren't allowed to ice and eat it. All you were to do was bake her a chocolate cake and feed it to her warm. And me and her would sit there and we'd just go to town on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but once I was with her, one day I, she was funny as heck. We all know she wasn't a housekeeper. <laughs> I called her one time and said we were coming down to stay for the weekend, visit with her. She said, well, I'm not going to be home. I'll be at my father-in-law's. Call me when you get there. So I called her. She says, are the dishes done? I said, no. She goes, well, call me back when you're done. <laughs> like two and a half hours later, I got to call her back. <laughs> so, we all know how that was. <laughs> but. God, she could cook. <laughs> Linda could have nothing in her cabinets and come up with something great to eat, you know. But I had so much fun with them all my life. I miss Larry. I mean, I know he was, you know, cranky butt, whatever. <laughs> but I really miss all the times with them. Linda's a big hole in my life. I'm glad she's not suffering. That woman went through so much in her life. She had a bad, hard life. And, uh, and she always kept so positive. She was always positive, always smiling. Uh, she had her faith. I mean, she really had a faith that a lot of people don't know about. Because Linda kept a lot of things private. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't think it by watching her and how explosive her personality was, but... Uh, she had a lot of private thoughts and things that we shared, and I know she wished she'd have been a better mom at times and things, but she did the best with what she had at the time, and she loves her kids. So, she was a heck of a woman. She was. <laughs> and I'll never get over losing her. Linda had several years that she had really bad health. She wasn't that old, that she had, I don't know exactly what all started at all. I know she had thyroid surgery and she, that didn't go well. And it, it was a, she ended up with a, having a trach in her, in her throat. And, um, but she always stayed so positive. And we go, I can remember David would take me more than once. David and I would go down to Kentucky to see her. And, and she was always so happy to see us. And like the sisters, the week after mom died, even then, she was in the hospital for something then. And we went down to Mount Sterling, Kentucky to visit her not long after mom died. And we, it was so neat because we, we stayed in a little hotel, a motel, and we went in, and every, we always have fun when the sisters would get together anyway. We act like crazy idiots, but we just do a lot of laughing and having a good time. But we walked into that room, and laying on the, on the top of the dresser was a little card that said, this room has been inspected by Rose. And that was just something, because we felt like Mom was telling us she was there with us. But we went to see Linda, and I'll never forget. <laughs> Linda, Linda, we go in. And she's sitting there, and Robin, Robin goes, we, we got ready to leave, and this little hospital, it was a real pretty little hospital, but we got ready to leave, and we walked, we rode around the back, because her room had a window in it, and Linda had got up to go to the bathroom, and we, were, we pulled over and stopped right by the side of the street, where you could see down into the room where she was, and she came out of the, out of the bathroom, and when she did, Becky or Loretta, whoever was driving, beeped the horn, and Robin was standing there, and she pulled up her shirt and flashed her. <laughs> and then one time we went to see her, and I think, I, I don't know, I don't know, Andy was with us that time, and Becky was working at Kroger, and Becky used, they used to have all these, um, like in the deli, they would have like things that they put up to advertise, and she had this, the Viking hat, and uh, we go walking in, and as we're going down the hallway, they stuck that hat, I think Robin put her hat on that, on her head, and she walked in the room, and Linda had just had surgery, and had drainage tubes and everything, and she just was cracking up laughing, and was holding her stuff, because it hurt so bad that she couldn't hardly really stand it. Linda was 14 years older than me, and besides just the lovely memories that I have of her prior to her passing, yeah, she was always, Linda was always, uh, she had her issues in life, and not a lot of, uh, she had some hard times. But when she'd come back there, it was always just so good to see her and Larry and 
there was always Linda always had a smile and a laugh, and she had a she loved mom so much. Her and Sue and Linda, Linda mom and Sue, when they get together, it was always fun to be a kid and watch because I was that much younger, and mom was like not a, a whole lot older than them. It didn't seem at the time, you know. And it was like so seeing how they interacted. And even with uh, music and stuff, like uh, everybody talks about when mom broke her toe doing dancing and stuff. Well, that's, I don't actually remember that myself, but I remember just that uh, there would be music playing and mom and, and uh, Sue and Linda would be dancing and stuff in the kitchen and stuff. It was, I mean, they'd be dancing like it was band, American Bandstand or something, you know? Yeah, and I was singing and everything, and it was like, that's the thing too about being blessed about being from a big family and I'm the seventh out of the nine was that uh, I got my love of all kinds of music from mom and dad. I mean we had you know the country music, Midwestern hayride stuff and then you know then Linda and Sue was uh, four, like I said Linda was 14 years older so she had the uh, like Fats Domino and all that stuff and then David had his type of music and then Ron had his music. Well, I think I remember the first time I ever heard Elton John was Larry had brought him home. Yeah. Ronnie, so I mean, you know, Ronnie was the Four Seasons. Yeah. So he there was a, the Four Seasons. There was, you know, there was always a lot of cool music influences all the way down. It was like, and Mom and like I said, I could remember Linda and them dancing and carrying on. You just thought they were schoolgirls, you know. So, <laughs> and I was little at that time watching them, you know, younger, but they sure had fun. <laughs> I felt. Good, but I also felt bad for her kids because at the end, the last year or so of her life, she lived in a nursing home up here, and we were. I was happy that we could go see her, and I would. I went two or three times a week at least, and my kids were so good about because her kids couldn't come. It was too hard for them to get up here. They did come when they could, but they weren't able to be here often. And so Angie and Tara and Josh, all three, were real good about going and visiting her, and she loved it. And um, whoever came, well, she gave us each a list. I'd go in and she'd say, "Next time you come, I want you to bring me some." And she'd tell me a list, whether it was some kind of cheese and crackers or something good that she wanted to eat because she had food there, but she didn't always get the stuff she wanted. Well, then I'd find out I'd talk to Robin, and Robin would say, well, she told me to get her that. And then our cousin Donna would come, and she'd come bringing stuff. So she would give us all her list of what she wanted to eat. And, but we'd go in there, and as bad as she was, sometimes she couldn't hardly talk because of her issues that she had with her throat. But, oh, she'd just crack up laughing. And... And I remember one thing that I thought was so funny, Robin coming in, Robin might have said this on her things, but Robin come down the hallway, and when, when you went into Linda's room, there was a curtain there where they could pull for privacy. And she had a chair, she said, and it was like a lift chair. And she was sitting in that chair, and when Robin came around that curtain, Linda, Linda starts singing, this girl is on fire, you know, just real clear and everything. And before that, sometimes she couldn't even hardly talk. And then it got to be where like, when one time Andrea, on Valentine's Day, my granddaughter Andrea said, I want to have a party for Aunt Linda. Let's go to let's go to her room. And so we all, um, Tara and Andrea and Kylie and I, and we all went over and, and we had a birthday party in Linda's, or a Valentine party in Linda's room. And Andrea picked up an uh, ice cream cake. And one of the nurses even, they got his plates and stuff and we shared with them. But Linda loved that. And, and one time Andrea stuck, she had a little chihuahua dog and she snuck it in the room so Linda could see that. And we, we just cracked up laughing and, 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 um, Angie would try to decorate her room with a, put something on the door for the, to make her door decorated pretty and everything. And then just the week before she died, she, uh, <clears throat> she had told me, she was so much in the mood, she said, I would love to have some scrapple and some eggs and some toast. She goes, that would taste so good to me. And I said, well, I'll try to get you some and get it to you. Well, that next weekend, we had a big birthday party for one of the kids and we were going downtown. And um, I wasn't going to be able to go on Sunday. And Josh had told me, he said, Mom, I don't think I'm going to go. He says, but I think I'll stay and go home and go and visit Aunt Linda. So I told him, I said, well, you know what? She really would like to have some scrapple and some eggs and toast. I said, if you could take that to her. And he said, oh, I'd be glad to do that. So he went to Mama's Grill in Williamsburg and picked it up. Well, they had, they had a special, and they also had fried potatoes with it. But he went in, and when he came in, she always lit up when Josh would come in the room. But that day, he said she didn't even, she always went him to, she enjoyed listening to anything he had to talk about, but she was uh, so excited to see the food. He said she didn't even say nothing. She just sat and nodded and smiled at him, and she was eating. And she ate every bit of that except for the potatoes, and she didn't ask for them. She ate the, the getta and the, and the eggs and the toast, and I think that was the last good meal that she had. As time goes on, um, my memories are more of when I got to be an adult. Um, for me, 
the time that I spent out there was when I would go out on the weekends to visit with uh, mom and dad uh, at the farm. And dad and I got into a, a um, thing that we, every Saturday, it seemed like, or Sunday, if I could go out there both days or one, or, one day or the other, that we would uh, always load up the tractor, the trailer, and all the chainsaws and, and uh, head to the woods. And, and there were times when we would go back there, whether it was you know in the middle of the summer, very, very hot, or middle of the freezing cold winter, there would be times when, um, uh, as time goes by, we wouldn't even start up a chainsaw. We would just go back there and sit, build a fire, and sit and talk for a long, long time. And for me, Dad got to be the wisest man I ever knew, and the most supportive man that I ever knew. Um, it's a side of him that I, unfortunately, I don't know that a lot of my siblings got to see of him, and I, I think that's regretful because he was uh, a very stern man, but he was a very loving and caring man too. He um, sure helped me through a lot of tough times as I went through the divorce and everything with Joanne, um, and then uh, I confided a lot of things in him that. Uh, uh, I couldn't have told anyone else, but uh, it meant so much to me to have him there to be somebody that would listen and supportive of everything that I was going through at the time. wasn't criticizing me in any way, but he was very he listened and he was very supportive of, of everything that I went through. And then it was a big deal too in the summertime. Uh, we didn't get to do a lot because of being on the farm. We didn't go places a lot when you have a big family, but we would go to a uh, he, I can remember him taking us to Coney Island on Plumber's Picnic Day, and he was always in a real good mood that day. Or when we would go to Kentucky on Memorial Day. But um, one of the good memories, and this is this is something that's not a, a necessarily a fun thing, but I always felt secure. Dad wasn't affectionate to us as much, but with Mom, he was. And I can remember how it made me feel good because when they'd watch TV at night, he'd always sit and he'd hold her hand. And, uh, he, and he was affectionate with mom in front of us, which made me feel good because I always felt like they loved each other. And, uh, and he always let us know he, he loved us. And I can remember, too, uh, being a little girl and him coming into the bedroom. If I was sick and he'd say, do you want me to bring you anything tonight whenever I come home from work? Is there something you want me to bring you? Mom was fantastic. Dad was dad. Um, he was always so tired when he'd get home at night and things that... We didn't really, he was more unapproachable. And we were told to, you know, kind of be quiet and stuff because he was tired. He'd had a long day. I remember Dad coming home in the summer after work, grabbing a bite to eat and hitting the fields and working until after dark and just coming in worn out and doing it all over again. And Mom getting up every morning and fixing him breakfast and packing his lunch and he, it just it was a hard life for them but you don't really realize that till you get old enough to know what it's like but grandpa i'm sure it was uh every one of us had different memories of him but some of my favorite times is in, when uh when i was really young and when we first went out there there was a lot of stuff that we did that was uh it was hard work, but it was neat the way he approached it. You know, he, 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 your grandpa was always a hard worker. And uh, just, I'm sure every one of them will tell you the same thing. Uh, he was a hard taskmaster, but I don't know that any one of us ever asked him for anything. He may have, he made you, he may have made you think twice about asking him. But I don't think any one of us ever asked him for anything that he didn't do for us. That was just, just the way he was. Yeah. You know, he was, uh, you know, I'm not sure you can remember how he, he'd tease you about being hungry or yeah. whatever. It was just, it, it's just the way he was. He was, uh, he was, a, he was a good dad, good, good parents, really good parents. When we were little, before we had so many kids, I can remember when Linda, Linda and David and I were little, if one of us had a birthday, he would always buy the birthday pres present. Mom didn't get out and shop much back then, so he would go to the store and he'd buy a present for the one that had the birthday, and he'd buy something little for the other two of us. And I guess after, after three kids, when we started having more, it got to be too much, so he couldn't do that anymore. But I can remember one year he got us little lockets, and I think they had perfume in them. 
and I wish I'd have kept it, but as a kid, you know, they probably got lost or torn up or whatever, but, but uh, and he thought of that on his own. He did that himself, you know. I had, you know, I had a little bit of a time growing up with him. He didn't give me a lot of self-confidence at times, and, but I know that he, I know that he loved me, and before he died, we became a lot closer, and I actually, I'm so thankful to God. I prayed for that, and I got that, so. But he was a great dad. I wouldn't train him for anything. I always remember feeling just immensely proud to be his daughter. I, I mean, I had such a sense of pride to be a Cranfield and to to have him for a dad because I felt like no matter what, nothing was going to get to us or hurt us and that he could take on the world and take care of all of us. Mm -hmm. And he did that. He provided for us and he made me proud. I just felt proud of him. I just, no matter what, I just always felt like we were just a tribe. We were one for all, all for one, one for all yeah. kind of feeling. And he really, he wanted us to be that way. He, he liked being, he liked our family name, and he liked upholding that. You know, and he had a ton of friends, and I used to watch him interact with his friends, and I could tell he was funny. He had a good sense of humor. I wish he'd have shown that a little bit more at home. Yeah. But man, he really. He could be funny, and his friends would laugh at. I just remember thinking, "Gosh, he's a cool guy," you know. So, yeah, I have good memories, and he had some bad ones, but, but I wouldn't have traded again. I wouldn't. There's nothing I would fix, you know. I would wish I could have touched him more, or he would have touched me more, and those kind of things. But I'm, I'd give anything to have him back. One I remember is we were back. You know, Dad was always cutting firewood. You know, so we were back along the, the railroad tracks. And it was summertime, and uh, uh, we were cutting, and we shut the chainsaws off, sat down. I was sitting across from Dad, and uh, I saw a big old black snake come up to come up to behind behind him on the railroad tracks and come across there. And I just said something. I said, "Man," and he goes, "What?" I said, "Look at that snake." I didn't know he was afraid of snakes. So Dad came up out of there, and, and I, I actually saw him run. So <laughs> I'd never seen him run before, but. Uh, that was one. Um, you know, Dad was always serious, but he had a good sense of humor too. You know, so he was always uh, always thinking about like him and uh, his best friend Hubert Shannon. You know, we'd go over there uh, when Hubert, uh, not long before he passed away, was a really big man, and he would he he pretty much lived at the kitchen table, and he would lean on the table, uh, and every once in a while he would actually fall off, and he was so big he couldn't get back up. So. Uh, Dolores would always call mom, and mom would wind up, you know, wind up uh, getting a hold of me or Larry or Dave, and uh, you know, getting us to go help Dane get up off the floor. And I'd go in there, and and you know, and they would have between Dad and Dane, they'd have these carboys, these five-gallon carboys, all stacked along the kitchen wall there, you know, full of apple juice and orange juice and grape juice, or whatever. They were fermenting stuff. They were making. They were making. Booze, you know. Just like kids, eh? yeah, exactly. <laughs> Big kids, yeah, old kids. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it was just, it's just things like that, you know. I mean, he was a, uh, you know, he was a, uh, you know, was strict. And I mean, there was times when I was a teenager where I tried to avoid him because I, you know, never wanted to hear what he was going to say because I wasn't wasn't doing things he wanted me to do, you know. But uh, but then to see him in those environments with his friends and with other adults, it was always kind of fun because, like I said, he he seen the kind of the, the fun side of him come out, you know. My dad. I can get teary-eyed. <laughs> my dad, uh, our dad, everybody's dad here, as gruff as he was, uh, I remember like from the time I was little, he always called me Sam. And he'd be like, come on, Sam, go out here, you know, whether it was going out to feed pigs or go pick corn or whatever it was, it was, you know, he, he called me Sam and that was always kind of a special little thing, you know. And then I remember in later years, it was like fun, like on, it was different, but on Friday nights, it was like a lot of times mom went to bingo, and um, when she'd be at bingo, then that was Friday night, and me and dad watched Dukes of Hazard and uh, making popcorn like before they had microwave, and he always loved that stuff, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we used, and that'd be the time when we'd talk more than ever, you know, because when he was just in the kitchen with everybody around, he didn't, you didn't get that one-on-one -on -one with him as much, you know? So I remember a lot of times having that one-on-one -on -one with him, and that was kind of, it's special. It was just yours. You know? In the summer, uh, Dad uh, used to really, uh, all of his life, Dad really wanted to be a farmer and uh, over being uh, in plumbing. 
and uh, and that came out in the summer because he was always excited and we the boys uh, would always get a straw hat in the summer and that was a big deal for us and and we were an integral part as we grew up uh, earlier years we were with him a, a lot in the older years he, he put us on machinery and we we basically worked and got done what he needed to get done um, I remember him coming home tired and and uh, and uh, still trying to do things. And, and Dave tells the story of a, of a tractor and running off the end of the field one time. I, I do remember that. Uh, well, I remember one time that uh, I was uh, crossing the field and, and planting corn in a field. And, and uh, I remember going back and forth and he had come home from work and he, he had a, a cold beer in the back of his truck and he had brought some seed to me. And he's at the end of the thing, leaning there, reading his newspaper, drinking a beer, and watching me go back and forth across the field. And we had a big stump in the middle of that field, and 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 we all knew to miss it, but the, I just guess I wasn't paying attention. So I go across there with that corn picker, and I hit that stump, and the shoe of the corn picker bent all the way around, and I couldn't hear what he was saying because the engine was running, but I could see him jumping and throwing the newspaper up in the air. And I knew that whenever I got the tractor down to idle speed and I could hear the voices that I was not going to like what I was hearing. But the outcome of that was we grew. Uh, he told me, you take it to the barn and you weld it, you fix it. And he walked away and, and I did and, and continued planting the next day. But uh, uh, that was uh, life on the farm. It was very exciting. But he, Dad was stern, but he also, he always, he had a lot of good things about him too. And I can, and I always remember when I was a, a a girl that if he called me Sudi, that was his pet name that he would call me and I loved when he called me Sudi because I always knew he was happy with me but one thing he didn't like when I was about 12 or 13 years old I got my hair cut for the first time I had never even had bangs cut my hair had never even been trimmed and he got upset with me and wouldn't talk to me for a long time because I got my hair cut off <laughs> so, but those are things I think about with dad you know I was in a hospital woman in the hospital with children's in September of 1970 and uh, I came out twice, but I essentially got out in, right before Christmas in 1970. And the whole time I was in the hospital, there was one day where either mom or dad didn't come down. I mean, now you figure that's before 275 was open. So, you know, that was not an easy drive and mom didn't drive. So, you know, somebody was always bringing her down there and dad, you know, he would, he would stop after work, you know, when he, there's other places he'd rather be, but I mean, you know, plus there's, you know, eight other kids, but uh, they always made a point, you know. And, you know, I always had a little gift or something like that they would bring to just coloring books or my favorite was an Etch-a-Sketch. I had that for forever, you know, in hospital, but I always made sure I had stuff to do, you know. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, they, you know, they were of the era where you just didn't, you didn't, you know, express your emotions a lot, but they always showed them in other ways, you know. Mm -hmm. so, but, yeah, that was... I've never forgot that. That's always was important to me. Because he was a good guy. He was it just he just didn't. He seems so abrupt as dad, you know. But when you got to talk to him one on one, he was you know, he's, a, he's a good fellow, you know. He, he had a sense of humor too. He just usually was so serious. While the rest of us, mom was making us laugh and joke around and act like clowns, you know. Mm -hmm. Dad was like keeping us on the straight and narrow, you know. Yeah. There were a lot of times where he would um, have have us each one sleep on the couch to keep the fire going overnight. I just remember I'd fall asleep. I'd just fall asleep and I wouldn't keep the fire stoked and he'd come stomping in there in the morning and I'd be on the couch and I would try to act like I was asleep but he would be loud and he would be pissed off because the fire was out and he'd just be bending over with his droopy old underwear right in my face stoking the fire and cussing and <laughs> that kind of stuff or like at night, when me and Greg were dating, I remember especially during that time, he, he'd go to sleep either, either with the remote in his hand, and the more he'd snore, the more he'd hit the loud button, and the volume on the TV would go all the way up. <laughs> and Mom would make me try to sneak and get the remote out of his hand. Oh, God. And he, oh, he'd wake up and startle, and then it would scare the hell out of me. <laughs> but waking him up to get him to go to bed, Almost every night his, his, his pants would just <laughs> fall down and then he'd shuffle. Mama would go this way, Daddy, 
we're going this way and lead him off to bed. He'd shuffle with his pants down around his ankle. And if I had a friend over, or Greg, before we, you know, back in the day, oh gosh, his <laughs> pants were always dropping. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like you, yeah. doesn't it, Josh? <laughs> uh, Dad had rented the Ellsbury Farm, which was out on 133. And as you went back Legion Lane, we had that with Gilbert Dufall. Dad and Gilbert had rented that. And we had it for, I know at least two years, but it was probably three or four years. And Gil and I had been working out there, and then Dad, would, when he'd come off, come off in, from the, in the evening, uh, I would go there from school while we were plowing and getting to see ready to plant. It was Cold Brothers Circus. It was over at the American Legion. And uh, your grandpa would come out there, work with me till dark, and then we would go to the house together. Well, this particular evening, the old, old Mrs. Ellsbury was still alive. There was a house there at the time. It's not there anymore. But there was a, a wash house in behind the house. And uh, your grandpa would come out there, and he, he says, uh, this, this is the type of guy he was. Handed me clean clothes, and he said, you go into a house there and change clothes and handed me money. He said, you take off and go across and go to the circus. But I remember Dad and me, he was always wanting me to, I think I reminded him more of Mom. And he'd be like, he always called me Rhett. Never called me by Loretta. It was always Rhett. And he'd, come on, Rhett, let's make some donuts. And we'd make, start making donuts. We'd have a mess. But things like that, he liked to do. And when he'd come in from cutting wood, he'd be a mess, a sweaty, stinky mess. And he'd sit down in that chair and pull his feet up and he'd say, Rhett, get over here and pull my boots off. <laughs> so you pull his boots off and then you'd have 10 minutes of cleaning up all the sawdust. But he, he was a heck of a provider. I wish they would have spent more money and time on themselves, doing things, going places. Mom always had a wanderlust. She always wanted to go, and Dad couldn't leave the farm, you know. But uh, I thought for sure when he retired that would be the end of it, because I didn't think she'd be able to stand in being home all day, but they learned to cope with it. <laughs> but um, it was a good childhood. It was fun. My boys practically lived there most of their young life. That's the only time I ever saw my dad cry was when I moved to Bermuda with Jeremy. And I don't think he cared that I was going. <laughs> if you talk about a very significant memory of that farm, uh, going back there, like I said, taking the tractor, the chainsaws, and there were uh, more than one occasions where we would go back there in the middle of the winter, it'd be freezing cold outside, but Dad still wanted to go. And um, there were times when we'd take a fifth of whiskey back there with us. And we would get back there, and if uh, if you knew your grandpa, Josh, it was one thing you could remember about him when he wanted to have a drink of good whiskey, he would unscrew the cap off of the bottle, and if you threw that cap away, you knew you weren't going to have to worry about taking the bottle back with you with anything <laughs> in it. We did that on more than one occasion, but I can always say Dad was always very careful about uh, you either, if you're going to have a drink of whiskey, you never start at the chainsaw. So <laughs> there were a lot of times we would just sit back there by a fire with a fifth of whiskey and just sit and talk. So but those are the wonderful times, the wonderful memories for me. As the fall uh, moved and uh, anticipation of, for some of us, was hunting season, that was always a good time with Dad because you'd get, uh, he, he would take us out and go hunting. and. I remember a story of dad hunting that was uh, hilarious. I thought I was pretty doggone good and I was probably 16, 17 years old and he and I went quail hunting. And I remember that day because um, I got a real rubbing out of it. We hunted for the morning, just the two of us, went back, the traction line went all the way across the back of the farm. He shot eight times, had eight quail. I shot a box of shells and didn't have one. <laughs> He never let me forget that. I think that was really important for him. It, it, all of us knew that dad wanted to skunk us at something. And I'll tell you, the thing I got skunked at was hunting. So it was a really, really fun time. He and I were in the very back field along the railroad track one night. And, uh, and I don't know how Larry or Ronnie was with the plowing, but whenever I'd done a lot of it, 
but whenever you got to the end and you were fin doing your finish furrows, your, your, your ditches at the end, I wasn't always the best at it. But we're working back there one night, and it was late. And you're, of course, it was on a work day. Your grandpa had been working all day. Well, we're finishing plowing that back field out. But we had a, a nest seed case, which uh, uh, Ronnie had a bad incident with that tractor in, in the barn there one time. But anyway, uh, we had this SC case tractor, and your grandpa was running it, and I was running a little Ford we had at the time. And we were, it was dry that dark. I mean, it was just, you could, you could see the silhouette of the guy when he passed you, but you, it was dark enough you couldn't see the face. So I passed your grandpa, and it was almost close enough where our, where our tractor tires touched each other. We were that close to each other. And I get to the end of the field there by the, uh, by the old railroad track, the railroad trestle. And I, and I turn around to go make my final pass across the field. Well, he's gone. He's just totally gone. And I thought, well, it wasn't like him to run off and leave you back there by yourself. And I'm thinking ill thoughts about him. <laughs> and I'm back there and I'm going making my last pass across this field and trying not to mess this ditch up. Well, I get about halfway across and it's the ones who would remember would have been back there. On the one end of that field was about the deepest ditch on the farm. Well, your grandpa, when he passed me, he had fell asleep on the tractor. And he, the, the tractor tires was keeping him in that furrow. So he just, you know, it, it steered itself. He went and just drove right off the end of the field and drove nose first down into the ditch. So, and I get up there, and here he comes walking up out of there. And, uh, and, he, and he did that from then on. He said, that's it. He said, from now on, he said, before it gets dark, he said, we're quitting and going to the house. But I kept thinking, well, he, he's run off and left me. <laughs> well, he had me fell asleep and drove in the ditch. Every year at Christmas, I really miss him because he'd always give me money on the sly. He always thought he was being sneaky about it, and I know he did it with other kids too, but especially in later years with me and Greg. And he'd give us money and tell me to go pick Mom out something pretty. You know, he always wanted to, and he would just... I mean, he was never cheap. He always would, like, give you a decent amount of money. And as, as afraid of him as I was, it's like, I love that. I love he was so tender about Mom. And he just, he'd want to know what I bought, and he'd want me to wrap it pretty. And um, it was always a big deal. Everyone will say, I can think of memories about Dad as far as, like, his lunchbox and him bringing you home something, saying, hey, there might be something in that lunchbox if you look, and there'd be something he'd bring home. His lunchbox always smelled like Fritos and bananas. <laughs> uh, throughout the summer, and, and I remember distinctively of going to the woods. On the hot days, we would get in the shade, get in the woods, and we would play, and, and we would always uh, have maybe a friend or two come over or a cousin to come in in the summer, and we'd get back in the woods, and and really enjoy it. I mean, there's all kinds of things uh, back there. I, I dug a tunnel with, a, with a, f a friend of ours that lived close by, a kid by the name of Timmy Byer. Um, and uh, Dave was friends with the older one, Randy Byer. And he and I got a project going back by the woods and we dug these trenches and we dug out this pit and we made it like a tunnel. We covered it with wood and leaves and everything else. And it, it was really a nice little place to go play. We put little candles in there and we go down and pretend uh, stuff. We were probably 10, 10, 11 years old. And then winter came and dad went back there with a the tractor and he, he, he seemed to find that mud hole and he sunk a tractor clear up to the axles on it. He didn't know it was there. We covered it well. That was another one of those events that I got some close, close up and personal uh, counseling on uh, as a result of, of, of doing that. But in general, um, he was always really proud of what we did and what we did to help him and, and to work on the farm. And the one thing too with Dad, and, and uh, I don't know, Dave may have told this, and it really wasn't funny for Dave, but um, Dad used to have a barber kit and he would cut all the boys because he had three little boys that he had to cut their hair. So instead of going to the barber shop, he had this barber kit. And he'd set them down and give them burrs. They all would have a burr haircut, which looked cute, you know, but that was, back then that wasn't, a lot of the little boys wore those kind of haircuts. Well, the one time he was in there cutting her hair, 
I think it was when my Uncle Leroy was there, and I think Dad had a few beers too, and he was talking and everything, and he started to cut David's hair, and when he did it, he forgot to put the attachment in, and he shaved it right down the middle. Instead of in the middle, like a, he shaved it to like at an angle on the side. So right away, they all, you know, he realized he goofed, so he did it like a V and did one on the other side, and they're all cracking up laughing, and David was laughing too. But then when David, David was just a little boy, and then he went and he saw his stuff, he was all upset. And then uh, he slept with a hat on even, and then Dad felt really bad that it was too, you couldn't put it back on there after he took it off, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't know whether you call that a funny moment or not, but Dad used to come up with, he, he one time he decided we, we would, uh, he raised horseradish and they were trying to grind that and we were all running around with our eyes watering and tearing. <laughs> and one time he decided we was going to have to make some, he raised grapes and was going to make some, he had his uh, crushing grapes and I mean he, he would come up with all kinds of ideas and stuff for <laughs> us to do. <laughs> But then another really early on story, and this was not Dad, but well, it was Dad, but it wasn't Dad. We had an old regular farm all tractor, and somewhere there's a picture of me sitting on this thing, and I'm five or six years old, and it was still when we lived on Ten Mile on 7, uh, 749. We moved to Bethel and brought that tractor with us in September of 1955, and. Uh, we were the second week, of, I was in the second week of the second grade, so we had all just started our, our school year and then had to move up here. But Dad was so excited, he bought a little 8 in Ford from Harlow Tractor. And the night they brought it there, Leroy was up there, and Leroy was the young wild man in the family at the time. You know, he was like everybody's favorite uncle. But Leroy was there and they unloaded that tractor and going back to where the garden was, that was all grown up with trees. It wasn't just open fields like the way you guys remember. Mm -hmm. It was all, the farm was all grown up. And then, uh, but I remember Leroy getting on that tractor and it come out there, it was nice and clean. Well, it wasn't clean for about <laughs> five minutes. Here it come, you could hear Leroy just running all over in the woods and the fields and throwing mud everywhere. But it was you know, just a lot of good men. You know, and I'm sure everybody else had affected him the same way, you know, but I mean, you know, we knew Dad was dying of cancer, you know, and, uh, you know, I was always naive enough to think that, well, you know, you've got time because you know that, you know, that they're not, they're not, it's not like you're dying of a heart attack and just drop over, you know. But just that whole time, really, and up through the hospital stay and, and when Dad passed, it was ex really stressful, you know, so, but the day of, uh, the day of the funeral, and I don't even know whose idea it was, but uh, Dad had a few open bottles there or whatever that was partially, you know, partially empty. And we took him out to the barn just because that was, you felt closest to Dad being out in the barn, you know. And uh, we emptied him. And it was uh, all the boys. And uh, we emptied him and we emptied him pretty quick. And uh, David was, uh, had the faculties the best about him, so... We suckered him into running. I think we ran down to Amelia to the liquor store, and we bought a whole bunch more and came back and emptied all that too. And by the end of that day, we'd filled up a wheelbarrow full of empty, empty liquor bottles and beer <laughs> bottles. And really, we just sat out there and we just sat out there and told dad stories. You know, it was a great, it was just, a, it was a good send off. It was a, it, for me, it was a stress reliever too. You know? I remember as a kid being out there for part of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's probably a time that said, "Okay, you need to go inside now." Yeah, it got it got pretty. At least on my part, you got pretty drunk out there. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs>
trying to find things for us to do and whether we were playing with her or playing outside, but she encouraged us to, um, I don't know, be ourselves, you know, play, like you said, play games or whatever. She was, she was definitely a fun mom and certainly, you know, somebody that you could talk to too when you needed to. Yeah. So I was blessed. I was blessed all the way around. Mom was a nurturer, you know, mom, uh, you know, mom always made all of us feel like we were her favorite, you know, even though I, I, I knew I really was. <laughs> uh, you know, I was baby boy and I, and I was sick and I was in a hospital for a long time. Mom really, you know, she took really good care of me, but uh, mom just had a great sense of humor. She was always, you know, she, my mom, my memories of mom are always in the kitchen, you know, always at the kitchen sink and uh, or fixing dinner and, and uh, you know, she, Always had, you know, not always, but she frequently had her cup of beer on the side. But mom was always one. She loved to sing and, and laugh and uh, loved to gamble. You know, I mean, I remember when we'd have our card games. Usually on uh, New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, or whatever, what dad would be in the kitchen playing. Uh, you know, he'd be in one part of the house playing penny ante poker. You know, mom and mom would be in the other room playing the high, the high stakes poker. You know, so and his dad was too tight to lose more than uh, a nickel or a dime at a time. You know, but mom was always the the one that, you know, I always try to guilt her. I try to guilt her in because she was kicking my butt playing cards, you know. And I'd tell her about, you know, not being able to feed my kids and stuff like that. And she'd just reach over and smile and pat me on the hand and say, "Honey, I've always taught you not to not to play with what you can't afford to lose." <laughs> but she'd still take my money. Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, mom, there's too many to mention. There's just, like I said, she's mom was a lot of fun. And like you said, when you were talking about earlier about. Her playing softball out in that we had a family picnic and it was years and years and years ago back in the back in the side yard there and yeah she was I, I was surprised because I'd never seen her I'd never seen her act like that where she get out and run and carry on and everything else and it was funny because like for several days after she couldn't hardly move it was it was hilarious but uh, now I understand that I get those feelings as myself every once in a while <laughs> but. Uh, she was a fun mom and always considerate. She always was good about making sure the children came first because there was a lot of times we always got what we needed, but sometimes I don't think mom always, she wasn't neglected. Dad was a good husband, but, but he loved for her to wear dresses and mom didn't wear dresses all the time, taking care of all the kids. She would do laundry. She'd run two, at least two days a week. She'd run that old Maytag ringer washer all day long. We'd be doing laundry. We'd hang the boys' jeans out on the line, and in the winter they'd freeze, and you'd have to go take them off the line. And they'd be stiff as a board, and you'd bring them back in the house to thaw them out. And and David, mom, he used to always want his jeans pegged. Back then, he would they called it, I think they called it pegging them or whatever, and he she'd pay for him to have that done at the. I think they took it to the dry cleaners, and they had numbers they went by. But he wanted his jeans so tight he could hardly get his feet through them. But she would pay to have that done for his on his jeans. But one of my favorite ones with your your grandma Cranfield, not not my grandmother, was uh, we'd had a the old barn was still there, and it was pasture field from the the old barn back to the to the garden where the old garden was, and we were having one of the picnics. It was going to be uh, just a ton of the aunts and uncles and cousins. There were always cousins there on the weekends in the summer, and usually some of them sp spent the week. But your grandma had played softball all day long. And I remember for like the next week, she, she couldn't walk. She was just, she had played so much and played so hard that she was just stiff and sore all over. And it was just, it was really funny to tease her about that. Because she loved, she, grandma was real competitive, as mm -hmm. you know. And uh, she would, she would have bet that if you'd have been able to walk across the road but not getting hit by a car, you know. <laughs> so, that was grandma. Well, with mom, I can remember her um, working in the garden, and I always hated to do the garden work, but she'd get out and work in the garden. I'd do dishes and stay in the house, but I can remember the walking back and, and, into the garden with her and walking out, her carrying back the bucket full of whatever kind of vegetables she picked. And, they, and even after you kids came along, uh, the grandchildren, she would always have a bucket of tomatoes or something there in the summertime, and she always... Whatever she had laying there, the kids could always have. She, but mom never told them no too much about anything. But with us, she was always uh, she was a fun mom. One thing I remember when I was a little older, Linda and I would we go to school, and if we heard a joke or whatever, we'd break our neck to get up the lane first so we could tell mom the joke because she always loved anything we tell tell her. Sometimes then she'd tell her if it was a little bit ornery, she'd tell it to dad, but she wouldn't tell him where she got it from because she didn't want him to, us to get in trouble, so she wouldn't tell. And she. Uh, 
but she would be a whatever we did like if we um she would be in the kitchen mom would wear a ponytail i mean she was a cool mom because we were young she was young when linda and i were teenagers and she danced with us she did the twist and and you know we danced around the kitchen table and everything and and she uh she was just fun to be around and she was she uh you know, of course, as the other ones came along, she, was, she wasn't she was in this good health. But with us, she worked hard, but she was always a fun mom to have around. And whatever friends we wanted, our girlfriends or whatever, was, she always let them come to the house. And we, they all liked our mom because they thought she was cool, too. You know? mm -hmm. But she also, she was the kind of mom that, with as many kids as we ended up when they, being a big family, she always put herself last. And so she never got, she'd get a, a couple new shirts in the, in the summertime. Or in the winter time, she'd get like long sleeve shirts and and a couple pairs of long pants, and in the summertime, she'd cut the pants off and the shirt sleeves off and make shorts and shorts because she just didn't have the money to go buy them. She'd spend it on us kids when she had it instead of yeah. on herself, you know. Christmas time was was always, uh, I think, mom and dad always tried to play it off as, uh, you know, not such a big deal. But when it got closer and closer, you could see that they were both really into it. And uh, the thing I remember most about Christmas is their efforts to hide uh, Christmas presents and our efforts to go find them. Um, and I know that one thing that always became uh, true in that home is the closer we get to Christmas, the less likely you were to get into mom and dad's bedroom room. And even more or less likely were you going to get close to the two closets in that bedroom because that's probably where they stored a lot of it. But they used to lay away a bunch of stuff and dad would always come early come home early on Christmas Eve and he would he would take mom and they would go up uh, in, in somewhere and they would try to hide things in the trunk and in the back seat and cover it with towels or whatever but we still wanted to see what was there so it was a very very exciting time and I remember them getting up and and probably enjoying it more than more than 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 we did the one thing that uh, I think is most important about our mother and father is they gave more to us than they ever took themselves and an example of that was every year Dad would get frustrated because mom didn't want anything. She would rather spend the money on us. And when Linda got older, he would always have Linda go look for something for mom for Christmas. And uh, they enjoyed that time of year and, and uh, we all enjoyed it as much. There were certain things we all loved when she made. When she made French toast, my, I don't know how mom ever got a bite. She would, it, it'd take her forever. She didn't make it real often because she constantly had to be, by the time she got one fix for somebody, the next one would say, I want another piece. And so it took her forever. And then she also, once in a while, her and Dave would get the idea to make donuts, and that was like that with that, too, you know. But um, a couple things I particularly loved, and I wish today I could have it, and I could, you can get it, but it never tastes like mom's. It's tamale pie, and I can make that. I've made that before, and it's decent, but not like mom's. And the scrapple, and that's, I found that before. I found that there's a Mennonite store near me, and I bought that there, but it don't taste like mom's. And she would make that, and when she did it, it was a, it was a job, because she'd have to get, she had a little grinder, that she would uh, take it out and she'd have to she'd have to screw it onto the table and she the the scrapple had hamburger and it had sausage and it had that it had liver beef liver and she would put the liver in there she put a pound of beef liver and she would she would grind it up on that grinder and mix it all together and put it it had cornmeal in it but she she never used the recipe she would just uh, I'd say mom how how do you do it because I wanted to learn how to make it myself she said. Well, you just stuff the cornmeal through your fingers till it's just right, because she would stir it till it was just the right thickness. Well, I tried, even before she dried, I, I tried to do it. It was just not like mom's. But when after I got married, when she would say, it's, it was around fall time, she'd say, I need to be making some scrapple. And I'd say, Mom, if I help buy the stuff, can you make some and we can share it? And she'd say, yeah. And so I'd help pay for the hamburger and the, and the sausage and all the liver and all that stuff. And then I'd come down, and that day we would make it, and she'd send me home with a loaf pan full and then she'd have it and it was delicious but nobody can make that like mom and, and you know there's just some things that she did that nobody else could do well this time of year because it's starting to turn to fall i always think about her i can just envision her in a soft flannel shirt cooking up a big pot of soup of some kind and the windows getting all steamy and always when the weekends were coming and she thought that the kids would be coming around she wanted to have a big pot of something on the stove and she took pride in that and she took pride in like, if she knew Larry was coming, she'd make a pineapple upside down cake. Or when blackberries, or she could get her hands on blackberries, Andy got blackberry dumplings. It's like, we all had our favorite things. And it's like even on birthdays, every year I'd ask for cheesy meatloaf. It was like a Velveeta recipe or something, but by God, I got it on my birthday every year, you know. And dad really wasn't a big fan of meatloaf. 
but she'd make it for me no matter what. And she knew all of us kids and what our favorites were, and she took great pride in making sure that you got that. Yeah. You know? So, and her big iron skillets and biscuits and gravy. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> See, I'm, everything's going to be food related when it comes to me. But I think about mom every day in so many ways, and just her, her sweetness and her holding your hand, you'd sit at the kitchen table and she'd always reach over and squeeze your hand or give you a squeeze and I miss those, I miss her touch, but I miss everything about her. I loved her honor sense of humor. I loved how we could just look at each other and know what each other was thinking and she encouraged my ridiculous behavior, that's why I'm as crazy as I am. And a lot of times trying to make each other laugh while dad was sitting there. <laughs> and we all did that at the dinner table. Becky and Loretta and Andy, we were just like, because Dad always wanted us so quiet at the dinner table, and it was a big, it was a big fun time trying to make each other laugh, you know, mm -hmm. just because Dad would be, what the hell are you laughing at? What's so funny? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know he was the butt of the joke at the time. <laughs> he kind of was, but sometimes I think he was way more onto us than he pretended, because every now and then, even though he'd be looking at his paper or whatever, I'd catch a, catch a grin on his face, you know? <laughs> He knew there was no denying my, my behavior. And like, him and mom would be in the kitchen and I would be in the living room watching TV or something and dad was always, this is gross, but we're talking family. He would always rip a big one or something and I'd in the other room and I'd holler in and go, cheese. <laughs> like a minute later, mom would come in the living room cracking up laughing. <laughs> and I knew he heard me do it, you know? Yeah. So, and then, uh, I could tell so many stories, but they're ornery. And if great generations are going to hear this, just remember that your Aunt Robin was really, really twisted. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I have so many memories about Mom. It was, just, it was just my love of music, my sense of humor. I just, I loved singing with her. I just, I just loved playing games with her. How we'd sit, and this is bad too, but we just, she'd wait for Dad to close his eyes, so in the evening she could run and like, let's play some Scrabble or let's play Yahtzee, you know, <laughs> and then. The, Dad would wake up, Mommy, where are you? She'd like be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this was fun too. Memories of Mom. I mean, I can take things like uh, she would get so frustrated and so upset, especially at Ron, and she would start raising cane with him and just being very seriously upset at him about something he had said or done to her. And he would grab her arm and start kissing up her arm <laughs> all the way up and start saying, tissue drive me crazy when you speak that language, or so. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, Adam but mom would start out so horribly upset at him that she wanted to kill him, and by the time he got halfway up her arm, she was laughing uncontrollably at him. Still wanted to kill him, but for a whole different reason. So <laughs> she, was, uh, she was a good turned neat woman. Um, memories, I'll tell you one of the memories that I've got of mom is, is that um, I've got in there is the, the old cast iron skillet that mom had um, that you, even you, have probably eaten meals that were prepared in that thing. And I don't know how old that skillet is, but for me, that every time Joyce and I use that skillet, it's one thing that brings back that memory of, of, of watching mom at that stove cooking so many meals for so many years for mm -hmm. so many people. It just, it was, it's amazing to kind of think back on. And it was fun growing up with the brothers and sisters. We fought just like every kids do, but uh, we all knew we loved each other. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the boys were roughneck and fight around. And, and I don't know, some of the others might have talked about when mom would do laundry and they'd get in the middle of the, they'd be in there. And the next thing you know, because she'd have everything drug out and we'd be in and out of the house. And she'd try to chase them out, but of course, we'd always end up back in the house. And they, she'd be in there doing her laundry, and she had this stick where she would put it down into the wash machine to get the, like, pull the clothes out. The, to put them through the ringer and uh, it was hot water so she used a stick to reach down and pull out the pants or shirt or whatever and then she'd run it through the ringer washer well the next thing you know the boys would be in there and they'd be roughhousing in the kitchen and she'd say now boys stop it she'd say you're going to get to fighting and they'd say oh no mom we're just playing we're just having a good time she said somebody's going to get mad and you're going to start fighting oh no mom we're not going to do that next thing you know they'd be in the middle of the floor carrying on and somebody would be mad and mom had that stick out of there whack 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 she whacked on to try to break the fight up you know this is a little personal but when i got pregnant and mom had been through that and 
she sat there with me and cried because she knew I was going to have a hard life. But I knew she loved me and she was always there for me. Her and Dad got me out of scrapes quite a few times. And uh, I just remember as a kid, I always, when I felt bad, I wanted to go lay on Mom and Dad's bed. Mm -hmm. I just, the comfort. Mom was a comfort. And uh, she was funny. We'd sit and watch uh, the gong show on the weekday mornings. And she would just sit there and laugh so hard. She was, she should have been an actress. Mom should have. <laughs> but, uh, and Price is right. My God, we, I'd come running through the house. Loretta, Cranville, come on down. And Mom would just laugh, you know. And she, or get up and dance with us and sing yodeling. I love to hear Mom yodel and she yodel for us. She was good. I remember even, I mean, she was older at this point, but I remember her yodeling for me. So. Yeah, always as we were kids and stuff and singing us little children's songs and, you know, anything just to keep us happy and pass the time, you know. But yeah, she was, she was a very special lady. And I think every one of the grandchildren that got to know her were blessed. I wish she had known my grandchildren, her and dad. I wish they'd have known them. So we just don't live long enough for everything we want. I guess we never would, you know? There'd always be somebody else you wish you could see or somebody else that would have known them. Yeah. But I've never heard anybody talk ill of either one of them. No. And uh, that's a statement right there. There was something so, even from the time I was a little girl all the way till years later, just the comforting smell of bacon, <laughs> combination of bacon and smoke. <laughs> and you could see it in the air when I get up in the morning and come through and the light shine through the kitchen window. And it was just, I don't know. A lot of coffees on. A lot of coffee on. Bacon and coffee and like I said, it was just, sometimes mom would, she made the best pie crust, but she hated making them. But on, I remember days when she'd make pies and she'd surprise me when I'd come home after school and she would have taken all the extra dough from the pies and baked it for me with cinnamon and sugar. Those were good memories. I have so many. Mom, I could talk about forever. Bingo. Even before I ever started going to bingo with her, it was such a big deal and she looked so forward to it. And she would let me cut her hair. She would let me do anything. And I would fix her up and put her makeup on her and we'd share makeup tips. and. And uh, she'd always wear just the prettiest clothes, save her best outfit for bingo night, really doll it up and go out. That was fun. She let me stay home from school to go to, to, go to the store with her on Thursdays. <laughs> oh, Angie got to stay home some too. Sue let her. But, so those are all good memories. But the best mom ever. The best mom ever. My best friend. Well, one other thing I was thinking of was Mom and I, from the time I learned to drive, when I first learned to drive, I was 23 years old before I ever learned to drive. Well, I took driver's ed and that, but I never, Dad used to say, she's never going to learn to drive, she's going to be just like her mom. But I did learn to drive when I was 23 years old, and from that time, Mom and I would do our grocery shopping together. Before that, she used to go on Saturdays with my Aunt Kathy, and um, I, when I was a teenager, I'd stay home and and watch the kids while she'd go. When we were younger, we had to go and the dad would take us and we'd all sit in the back seat while they went in the store. But um, whenever I learned to drive at 23, every Thursday, Mom and I would go to the grocery store. And first, I just drove around Bethel to whatever we could do in Bethel. But after a while, I got braver and we'd go down to Kmart or on down the road or whatever and, and we'd do our grocery shopping down there. Well, <clears throat> we would always stop and have lunch. And before dad retired he didn't care about that because he really didn't know he didn't like it too well after he retired but because he always wanted her to stay home with him and he would have loved to take her to the store but me and her had a great time doing it so anyway we go to the store and, and a lot of times Angie and Robin when they were little they both they both would want to go with us in the summertime they would go so when school started I think behind our backs they were sneaking and playing and, and they would accidentally be sick or something would be going on on Thursday and they'd want to stay home and then go to the grocery store with us. Well, they got by with that son, but we didn't let them do that all the time.
But um, when we went out, like I said, we always ate lunch somewhere. Well, Mom, with her wicked sense of humor, she would we'd go out to eat. And when, when Robin was older and Angie was older, we'd go out to eat. And Mom and I would come home, and I would help her unload her groceries, and I'd go home and do mine. But she would be sitting there when Robin came in, and we used to like to go to like Long John Silver's, or we'd go to. And when one of the kids were there, they would have these little hats, and the kid, if you got them a kid meal, they'd have the, like a the hat, like the Long John Silver's had their little hat that they put on. Well, Mom would pick one of them up while we were in the restaurant, and when Robin would come in from school, Mom would be sitting there, and she'd say, "Guess where I ate lunch today?" And Robin would get so mad at her. Well, a lot of things with Grandma. I think this is probably one thing that everybody will will say is, is uh, grandma was really, uh, uh, I can remember when I was a kid, mom, uh, dad had this old old uh, Chevy, I think it was a Chevy or a GMC pickup truck, and mom in her entire life never had her driver's license, and uh, she would try her darndest, she'd take this old truck and get it back in the plowed fields back there, and I can remember being in the back end of this truck, me and a couple of the other ones, as mom is trying to learn how to work a clutch and, and shift the gears as we're driving across a plowed field that hadn't been disc or anything. So it was, we were all just bouncing all over the place and the whole time we were all just laughing like crazy. <laughs> mom never did learn how to drive. I don't think she could have driven an automatic, God love her. <laughs> but she always tried, she always tried to do that. Well, when, when Victor, when Victor, Ron and Sophie lived away and Victor was little and mom would always try to, he would, when he came home to visit, um, I remember the one time in particular he came home and he loved riding on Grandpa's tractor, and that was a big deal to him. And then as he got older than us, so he liked to ride on the uh, what he like the four wheeler or whatever you call that thing that if he would ride out. Dave would let him ride. He'd ride it all over the woods and or all over the fields and stuff. And I was on. And, I was and Josh, on the lot. Josh would ride with him, and they would have a good old time. But when he was little, I can't remember. He probably wasn't ever like four or five years old. And I can remember I took mom. Dad had decided he wanted to get him a, a tractor from the from the tractor store up in Bethel. I think it was Wolf's or whatever it was, and um, or Harlow's maybe. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was the one that was next to the Green Valley store. And I took her up there because she wanted to send him one for his birthday. Dad wanted to buy this little tractor. It looked just like the big ones. So we went in, and the, I parked at the Green Valley. And Josh and I was sitting in the car waiting on her. And she walked over there, and she went in, and she told him what she wanted. Well, they took her to the window to show her the ones they had. And the window was right where we were sitting. We could we were seeing her. And uh, Josh was watching, and Mom walked out that window, and the man handed her this tractor, and Josh goes, Grandma is buying me a tractor. <laughs> and I said, and I told her when she came out, I said, Josh, that's that's for Victor. When she came out, I told her, and she goes, oh, I can't do that. So she turned around and went back in the store and bought Josh a tractor, too, because she, she didn't want him to be disappointed since she didn't get that one for him, so <laughs> she bought him one, too. I think we had the best of both worlds with our parents. Because of you know we were fortunate enough to have a mother that was home with us and you know just remember not only just mom and dad but then our grandparents being there and our aunts and the the it was even though it was our farm then it was ours I think my dad's family and my mom's family their siblings and their families all loved that farm as much as we did I bet you could go to any of our adult cousins and they could tell you memories of that farm because it was just the place to be. Yeah. It was home base, I think, for dad and mom's family too. It felt like, it just felt that way. Everybody could just come there and walk in and be in the kitchen and next thing you know, you're all eating dinner or playing a game or something, you know, it was just yeah. the place to be. I remember when Andy was born, each kid, mom at first, she might be a little bit nervous about having another baby, but usually by the time she was knew for sure she was pregnant, she'd start planning for the next baby. And with me being older, I can remember that stuff. And I can remember when Andy was born, Linda would get, she says, Mom, if you have any more kids, I'm leaving home. Because she was, we were getting older by this time. So Linda had left home when Mom had Robin, and I was a senior in high school. And I, Robin was born in April, and I graduated in, in the end of May. So um, she was just a baby. And then I started dating John, and she was just a baby when we got married. Of course, she was, I think Mom was 39 when Robin was born, so she was getting older. But nowadays, that's not unusual. People do that all the time. She... We all we we all spoiled Robin because she was she was fun having a new baby in the family and that. By then, she, when Angie and Rusty came along, Mama still having she had her own little baby to take care of. So she really didn't she loved them, but she wasn't like she was a grandma yet. And by the time Tara came along, then she was a grandma. She was ready to be a grandma, and she spoiled her rotten too. And she thought Tara was so cute. And um, then here come Jeremy, because then Loretta was there, and Loretta even lived with them for a while. And and when Jeremy was born, of course. 
he, we just all adored him too. And like I can remember mom, she would laugh because she'd sit down in the chair to hold Jeremy, but she'd always scoot to the side and make room for Tara to climb up there with her too. Because as she was the same kind of grandma that she was mom, she always made us all know that we were very special, each, each kid and each grandkid.